Thank you for uh, being here tonight and for your patience as we assembled. And um, we're, we've got a great panel for you tonight. Um, hearing the names, faces, and stories of students and their real lives in 2019 and sometimes what that takes to be successful. Um, my name's Nancy McGee. I'm the County Superintendent of Schools. It's an honor to be here in the San Mateo Union High School District. This is a really <clears throat> innovative district around the issues and topics and actions around mental health. Um, this is one of the first uh, school districts in San Mateo who has taken on uh, the work of mental health inside the district as a staff, um, a professionally hired staff effort. And that has taken a lot of vision, a lot of um, planning, and the moxie of the leaders to say, yes, we want to invest our money and our time and our energy to build a program inside our school district that supports the mental health of our students. So hats off to Superintendent Kevin Skelly in the San Mateo Union High School District, to um, Mary McGrath, who um, led this work several years ago, and um, is now at the County Office of Education. We're so thrilled to have her working on behalf of all students in the county. And then also to April Torres, who you will hear from tonight, leading that work. So I first came to do, um, to be partnering with Congresswoman Spear in 2013 after the tragedy of Newtown which happened in December of 2012. And as soon as that event occurred, there was um, a call to the County Office of Education and other school leaders around the county by Congresswoman Spear and other local officials to say, we have to do more. We have to step forward and do more for our students and the safety of our, of our families. So we did step into a very broad and engaged conversation in April of 2013 around what it takes to build systems that support student safety and ensure supportive schools. And all with the um, passionate, energetic, and active leadership of Congresswoman Spear we have, in the last six years, developed a system in San Mateo County that we, go, we call the Coalition for Safe Schools and Communities. We have addressed um, emergency response for our schools. We have um, developed school-based mental health collaboratives all across the county. And we have created common protocols um, for mental health support for suicide prevention, and also for commercially sexually exploited children, which is also uh, one of those threats that um, is out there um, attacking our vulnerable children in our communities. It's important because schools are the center of a, of a child's life. Uh, all kids come to school. And so School leaders <clears throat> see those students every day and are able to keep eyes on them. Um, so with these protocols that we've been able to develop, we've developed multiple layers of safety nets to help catch students as they pot potentially may fall through the cracks. We don't want any students in San Mateo County falling through the cracks. We want them all launching off diving boards into future success with lots of passion and abundance. So we're here tonight to hear from students sharing their own stories. Um, and it, it, it would, this would not be happening without the, um, again, the leadership of Congresswoman Spear and her staff. It is my pleasure to be a partner in this work in San Mateo County and to learn um, from her strong leadership. Um, for every child from birth to 22, she is a champion and an advocate. 
So may I introduce to you now Congresswoman Spear. Thank you, Nancy, very much. Nancy is completing her first year as superintendent of San Mateo um, Office of Education. So um, well done. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to also um, thank each and every one of you for making this a priority tonight because I think it's that important. And the fact that you're here says volumes. I wish it was um, twice as filled. I, I wish every seat was taken because I think it's that important for our children and our community. But I'm deeply grateful that all of you are here. Uh, I also want to say a special thank you to Janae Luttrell and Mary McGrath from the San Mateo Cal County Office of Education and to the San Mateo Union High School District. We've been joined by a number of elected officials here tonight. Uh, Dave Pine, San Mateo County Supervisor. Dave, are you here? Not yet, maybe. Okay. Um, Diana Reddy from Redwood City, Redwood City Council member. There you are, Diane. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Michael Brownrigg from the Burlingame City Council running for the State Senate. <laughs> Sue Degree, former Pacifica Council member. Sue, welcome. <laughs> Elizabeth uh, Bradell from the Pacifica School Board. Elizabeth? Sarah Coffey, the Pacifica City Clerk. <laughs> uh, Georgia Jack, the president of the Sequoia Union High School District. And is Tom Moore here? There he is, Tom Moore, former San Mateo Community College. Board of Trustee, former president of Kenyatta College, and former superintendent of the San Mateo Union High School District. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining us tonight. All right, more importantly, thank you to all the young people who are here tonight and who have inspired this event. I'm going to tell you how this originated. As you may know, I have a robust student intern program both here in San Mateo County and also in Washington, D.C. Typically, there are high school students here and some uh, community college students uh, in the local office and then uh, college students in the D.C. office. And as a task at the end of their student internship, most recently, they were asked to develop a town hall concept, both the idea of what it should be and develop a flyer and identify who should be speakers. And what was really interesting about it was that three out of the 12 interns at the end of the program all were interested in having a town hall on mental health and youth. And I was stunned, actually, that there were so many of them that came up with that idea and also recognized that we have work to do. And so that was the genesis of this program tonight. The pressures that young people are under that are crushing them. And I think it was really important that we, together, both these young student interns and my office work together to bring you this program tonight. So I'm going to ask um, the student interns who are here, many of whom have conceived of this, um, Connie Gong. Connie, would you stand? Where is she? She's not here yet? Oh, she's back here. OK. <laughs> Ari Leventhal. Ari, are you here? There you are. Joseph Eden and Allison McLaughlin and Caitlin Kagawan. There were a number of resources outside that you may have become aware of. One of them is Safe Space Youth Action Board and their members, including Novak Jernuski, Bella Marinos, Samar Bahu, Risa Nessam Mafi, and Kai Doran. Excuse me if I somehow muffled your pronunciation of your names. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Now I'm going to have Connie come forward, who is going to explain why she came up with this event. Connie? 
Hi everyone, my name is Connie and I'm a junior at Carlmont High School. And so as a Congresswoman mentioned before, when I was an intern, we had to do this like capstone project of sorts, which was basically to create an event like this with a specific issue in mind. And when I heard about this project, I immediately knew that mental health was the issue that I wanted to tack tackle with my event because it's an issue that's very personal and important to me. As I grew up, it was an issue that I saw so many of my peers struggling with, and it was something that I struggled with as well. And so I wanted to create an event that specifically spoke to youth in letting them know that they aren't alone. And with that purpose in mind, I created this event. So I hope that after you listen to this incredible panel of speakers, you'll feel empowered to reach out for help and to continue the conversation because mental illness is not something that we should have to fight alone. Thank you. <laughs> well done, Connie. Well done. Does that make you feel good about the next generation when they are as um, impressive as Connie is? Thank you again, Connie. So why is this so important right here, right now, in San Mateo County? Well, first of all, studies have shown throughout the United States that the trends are going in the wrong direction. From 2005 to 2017, for the ages of those 12 to 17 years of age, the number of major depression episodes increased by 52%. Think about that to have that big an increase. Um, but it gets worse. In California, in 2017, 32% of high school students experience depression. And right here in San Mateo County, we have some of the highest rates of students who've been admitted to hospitals for mental health-related issues. So again, I'm grateful that you are all here. And I'm grateful to the young people uh, in our uh, community, and particularly those who have been in leadership positions who've helped put this event on uh, tonight, because I think it's that important. When you signed up today uh, for the event, one of the questions we asked was, if you are a teen, what aspect of life affects your mental health the most? And overwhelmingly, the answer was, by 81%, school. One student wrote, in our area there is an endless competition for who can be the best and I think that it's really difficult for teens to deal with that without the proper tools. Another student wrote, my parents in the indifference of adults. As adults we cannot afford to be indifferent. We have got to listen to the calls of young people who um, need our resources and our assistance, and we have to make sure those resources are there for them. The good news is, as um, Nancy McGee has said, this county has recognized that there's a crisis and has taken steps um, to deal with it. We will hear from two students, a school counselor, a high school principal, and a child psychiatrist. All of them are committed to improving mental health outcomes for young people. Our first speaker is Vivian Valdez. Vivian is a senior here at Hillsdale High School and joined Star Vista's Health Ambassador Program for Youth after her close friend and classmate took her life. As a HAPY ambassador, Vivian learned how to share her experience and spread awareness about mental health among her peers. Vivian, please come forward and tell us your story. Okay, so I graduated from HAPY earlier this year. It was a program that helped me understand triggers, suicide, and its prevention. It helped me bring myself to wellness before helping my family and friends. And towards the end, we had to create a short message dedicated to something we had overcome. To be, sincere, to be sincerely honest, I've only read this out loud twice, and I've cried every time. So if I cry, I'll, well, I'm going to try my best not to do so, but if I do, just like, be patient with me. Okay, so months and eventually years will go by, but I'll never forget you or be able to describe how this feels. 
a complete wake up call and I'll always be thankful for having the opportunity to see kindness in a different light. From my first plane ride with you, to the notes passed in seventh grade, to the last physical thing I have from you that says you made me smile. On my red notebook, you never think you'll be put in that situation, but when it came, it changed my perspective in every form. It's completely changed my need to advocate for mental health, even though it's taken so much time in such a heartbreaking situation for me to understand. I promise now never to give up on myself because I see how everything matters. And I'm sure you never would have thought your absence would reach me or that I'd remember all the little things about you. I'm at peace knowing you're finally resting after such a long fight. To the last time I saw you, I'm forever grateful because you left with the biggest hug. So to anybody who isn't here, and to all the family members or friends that didn't make it, to all the people that don't believe they matter, you should be here. So I'm really just here up to say that like, I've struggled personally with mental health, mostly in school, like the Congresswoman mentioned, and I think that's really reflected in my grades for the most part. And personally for me, what helped me was always having like a teacher reach out to me or having someone who really cared, not because they had to, but because they like genuinely cared. So I'm really happy you guys are here, and I hope you have fun hearing from Fennel, because he's someone who I graduated hot by with. Thank you so much. Fennel Schubert participated in the same health ambassador program as Vivian. Fenn is a recent graduate of Cappuccino High School and a first-year student at City College in San Francisco. Fenn was diagnosed with multiple mental illnesses uh, at a very young age and says that it's something he contends with every day. He hopes to one day become a licensed clinical social worker to help other people with their mental health. Fenn, thank you for your courage and thank you for joining us tonight. Gen Z problems, am I right? I am Fennel Schubert. I use he, they pronouns. I am an 18-year-old freshman at the City College of San Francisco. I am also a Hapwa Youth Ambassador, diagnosed with bipolar with psychotic symptoms, other specified disassociative disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and anxiety. Due to this, according to the state, I am disabled. I have been hospitalized several times, suicidal, manic, sick, traumatized, low, angry, and heartbroken, but I still have hope. A story about me. The first time I was hospitalized, I was most of the way through my first semester of freshman year at Burlingame High School, and it has been mostly blocked out by my post-traumatic stress disorder, but I'll tell you what I remember. I had told my teacher that I felt suicidal and I wanted to go to the nurse's office, which is how it had, ha had happened in middle school. I now find that deeply disconcerting. She called for a security guard and I was taken to the counselor's office. The counselor's office had a plant. It was not as well lit as it could be. I think the blinds were down. I don't remember her face or much of what she said besides the cold way she asked the questions and her asking if I wanted to kill herself and my re immediate response of yes. The cop lady who said that I wasn't in any trouble as she shuffled me into the car. If I was in handcuffs, I can't remember. In the hospital, where they kept me on Trousdale, 26 hours of absolute boredom and misery, nothing in the overlit room but a bed built into the floor that my mom sat with me mom on as long as she was allowed to. They moved me to Fremont Hospital, a place I quickly labeled the hellhole, Visit the visiting hours, the passing the criminally insane adults in the hall and having to stand along the wall. The one on and only other trans guy there, the only one who got it. The quietly whispering about ways to escape, as if we were in jail. There are many ways to be mentally ill, and most many people who go through mental illnesses don't go through the world like this, but enough do for it to matter. And if you're wondering, what can be done, how can we help? That's what I'll explain now. How to be an ally. First of all, what is an ally? Simply put, an ally is someone who supports any given community. How can I be an ally to the mental health community? Practice step up and step back. Basically, if you're talking a lot, 
then maybe let people like my voice stand up. Um, active and open-hearted listening is always good. Accommodations of all needs. For example, when I went to my college's um, disabled student services or DSPS and asked for the accommodation of being able to use a fidget, um, something to play with with your hands while you're in class, they said that they couldn't because every teacher has a different policy. This shouldn't be the case. If I need something and ask for it, I should be able to get it. What does an ally not look like? Does not take needs seriously, is only here for popularity points, does not listen, and talks over people who are actively part of the community. Some ways to get better are, for example, therapy and medication. We need to fight the stigma around these, especially medication. I am on medication, and the meds that I am on are literally keeping me alive. And I have had many an ignorant soul tell me that they're poison or that I don't need them. I have a life-threatening condition. You wouldn't ask a cancer patient to um, forego their medicine, would you? And then I want to give out a shout-out to RAP, which is Wellness Recovery Action Plan where in a group setting, you talk about write and write down what you look like when you're well, not well, in crisis, and what you need when you're well, not well, or in crisis, or and how to handle crisis. Some notes from my mom, who is a teacher. I know that in education, there are a lot of things we can't say to do due to fear of liability and not wanting to give the wrong information. But after going through the unique hell of having a suicidal child with, who had to endure multiple hospitalizations, I wish that when I first got the call that my child had been 5150, someone had something, said something like, you will be in the ER until they find a placement for your child. Once they are placed, your child will be taken to the hospital in an ambulance. They cannot be driven in the family vehicle. You can only visit during visiting hours. They will hold your kids for 48 to 72 hours. It usually takes around five days from the 911 call to when your kid can come home. She also said that if you're in the position where you have to 5150 someone, remember that you are taking away someone's rights and their parents' custody. That is not to say don't do it. If the situation calls for it, absolutely do it. But remember the power you hold. Some closing notes. The struggle is real. I am still struggling. It, or life, doesn't necessarily get better, but your ability to handle it does. And keep fighting, do what you love, art, writing, reading, even math, whatever. <laughs> Remember that Katy Perry quote, after a hurricane comes a rainbow. People do or will love you, I care, and I believe in you, you'll make it. Thank you. Ben, that was amazing. Thank you for being so forthright in talking about um, your struggles. And to your mom, mom, would you stand up so we can applaud you? So school counselors are often the first point of contact for teens experiencing challenges. Um, there is good news again because San Mateo Union High School District has teamed up with the Peninsula Healthcare District and Stanford University to launch an expanded mental health and wellness program that places mental health counselors directly in schools to meet students where they are. We're extremely lucky to have the manager of that program, April Torres, with us this evening. She has been working in the San Mateo Union High School District for 15 years and she started as a school counselor and later helped to design the mental health and wellness program she now manages. She holds a master's degree in counseling and educational administration and is a licensed marriage and family therapist. In her current role, she coordinates services for seven schools, seven high schools, and works on fostering community partnership. She also has a private practice. Please welcome April Torres.
Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the program that we have uh, throughout the San Mateo Union High School District. And if anybody here that works in the program or has any information that they want to add, Helen, mom, <laughs> if you want to add that, Alexis up front, one of our mental health therapists, um, uh, Francisco Gills in the back over there, um, and then Javier Gutierrez is my counterpart um, at Sequoia. So um, <clears throat> our program started, this uh, This is our fourth year. We had a three-year grant with the Peninsula Healthcare District, and Ashley McDivitt is here. Um, and we had the opportunity to work closely with um, Shashank Joshi and Vicky and a few other people and really look at what are the needs of our campuses, what do students uh, really need support with. So having young people talk about their experiences, whether it's in middle school or high school, we want to do better. We have to do better. That is our jobs to do better. So <clears throat> our program um, has evolved. We um, work with students one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we provide short-term uh, uh, school-based mental health. We run a lot of different groups for students. We also have drop-in hours, so if they're in class and they just need to come out and you know have a quick touchstone, we have that available too. We do classroom presentations on everything from what is a healthy relationship, um, leaving your cy cyber footprint, uh, addictions, so it could be anything from gaming to um, unhealthy relationships. We um, talk about mental health. We talk about what, um, what supports are out there for students in the community. And then uh, we do district-wide presentations as well for our students and families. We, um, we really take the time to work with teachers. Uh, we're bringing in SEL curriculum to be able to uh, support students on a different level in the classroom. So that's always helpful. Um, we have teachers that we're training um, on trauma trauma-sensitive practices, restorative work, not punitive, but restorative work. Um, we are able to support students with, um, with some of their, um, not, not necessarily addictions, but some of their habits that have gotten them uh, maybe in trouble. So if that's vaping or substance use, or they come to us directly saying, hey, we need a little support here. So we have evening programs. We have a substance use program. It's a six-week program where we include families. We have a two-week vape program. These are both in the evenings. We're also working on not uh, the punitive piece, not sending a student home uh, just because they broke a rule. So what we want to do is inform them so that they can make better choices with, infor with more information. So we'll have an, we have an alternative to suspension program as well that we offer. That's just a highlight of some of the things we do. We also work with our, with our staff. So our staff come to us and say, we want to do better. We want to be able to support our students. And if they're having a bad day, what are some of the signs that we can, that we can look at to, to be able to support? So we're also working with staff. And then we have conversations with um, our community partners. We are um, working closely with signing different uh, memorandums so that we can um, have our students at the top of the list for support services instead of having to wait three to six months for supports. So we're doing that. We work closely with Star Vista, Peninsula Healthcare District. There's, there's just a plethora of places that we, we work um, in conjunction with to support. Um, we are continuously writing grants to get support. Um, Peninsula Healthcare District, we wrote a grant, and we have the Stanford Teen Mobile Health Van that comes once a month 
to one of our sites, and they support our students with um, sensitive health care needs, immunizations, physicals, um, anything from medication. It could be medication for depression and anxiety to eczema cream. So they cover a wide range of services. They also have a registered dietitian, uh, and they have a social worker that supports um, the students as well. So um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. We, um, we work closely with our community, um, our middle schools, trying to see how we can best support students in middle school so that when they come to us, we um, have a better idea of their stories and how to support them. And then we work, like I said, with our, our sister schools. So in Sequoia, working with Javier, and um, how do we come together? What are the trends? What can we do as a community and support our students and families? That's it. I'll start. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Michelle Levin or Levine, I should say. She's the principal at St. Ignatius College Prep in San Francisco. She has a unique long-term view of student mental health. Uh, she has served in multiple roles at SI for 24 years. She started first as the college and academic counselor and later became the dean of students. After nine years, she returned to mental health services as the director of counseling and was instrumental in designing and implementing SI's wellness program. She's been the school's crisis response team leader for 13 years and recently became SI's 16th principal. She's made her students' mental health her primary focus and says that everything else will follow. Um, I must say, personally, I have known Michelle uh, through her parents. Um, the former county supervisor, Mike Nevin, uh, and his um, spouse, uh, Kathleen Nevin. And it's just wonderful to have you here now to speak to all of us. Please welcome Principal Michelle Levin. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. I don't consider myself um, to be much of an expert, but I do consider myself very, very passionate about teenagers and about mental health as it relates to teenagers. And I was listening to Fenn and listening to Vivian, and they remind me so much of the students that I work with, the students that I love at my own school. And um, they're brave and they're passionate themselves. And to share your stories, are, it's so inspiring. What is not to love about teenagers when you meet these young people. Thank you. So it's true that I was a, a personal academic counselor and a college counselor my, for my first 13 years working with teenagers, and I loved that work. Uh, I, I, was, I really felt a strong connection to teenagers, and I enjoyed working with students who struggled on any particular issue that you might be able to name. And of course, I had students that I worked with that had some depression and some anxiety, and eating disorders were, were not um, unlikely at my school, and I loved that work. We met as a department weekly, and we would talk about different cases that were difficult to deal with and would collaborate and decide if we needed to reach out for, to other resources or therapists in our community to help us deal with, with um, one student or another. Um, and I enjoyed doing that. But I did step away for, for nine years when I was offered a job as a dean. And a dean at my school is in charge of discipline. So I had about a decade where I had moved out of the counseling office, but still, of course, if you're in charge of discipline, you never move away from, from mental health issues. Um, and I certainly saw the connection between behavior and mental health issues while I was in that office. But what was really upsetting and disturbing for our community was that during that time, we suffered the loss of several students to suicide. And although it wasn't my job, I felt very compelled to do my research in, the, in a private school, it's a little more difficult to reach out to resources or to know where to go to reach out for resources. I like to call Shashank Joshi my trusted adult. 
Um, I, we found our way to Shashank, and he helped us tremendously um, during that time to, to navigate a response to our community. And, uh, and we, we then partnered with, with Challenge Success, with it, which is a tremendous program down at Stanford, and they help schools to build up nurturing healthy school environments. And they've been a tremendous help. And we work with suicide prevention, of course, during that time. What I found, I learned a lot. I dove into reading to try and figure out what was going on uh, with our students. But I couldn't find much at that time. Not as much as I found when I moved back into counseling after that almost decade period being a dean. And I, I was the director. By that time, we had hired many extra counselors to work on our staff. And we, we had hired three therapists to work with us. And so we felt pretty comfortable in our ability to react to crisis when crisis came up. But not all that comfortable when it came to prevention, even though we had done a lot of work in that area. Um, we still didn't feel very comfortable. Well, when I became director, I was absolutely, my, my mind was blown at what I saw. Again, having been gone for a decade, I, when I came back to the office, all of our conversations were about students who struggled with mental health needs and serious mental health needs. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how different my life was, my daily life, when I was charged with managing now 18 adults who were managing cases working with our students. And we had at least 20 to 22 in one year to 25% of our students who needed real care from our wellness staff over issues that they were dealing with. And hospitalizations were common to talk about. Um, so I really dove into the research again. And then I was able to find some things about what's happening with our youths and, youths and what is different now um, than, say, when I was growing up. And I graduated in 1988. And there, of course, are a lot of differences that you could break down. And there's no one thing that causes uh, mental illness for a person. We know that. And there's genetics. And um, there's pressure. And we talk a lot about how pressures are different these days than they were. When, you're, when you look at our kids involved in co-curriculars, and there's club sports, and there's school sports. And if you want to get into college, you're competing to get into some of the same colleges that I was competing to get into. But it's way more difficult to get in. Um, and you're trying to take too many AP classes in, in many cases. And there's pressure from your parents and there's pressure from society that if you find your way to this great, this best college, for example, there, you're going to have a great life. Um, social media obviously has its impact. And there are some wonderful things about social media. And we use it in a lot of great ways. But it, it's had a, a major effect on our kids in the way that they socialize with each other. And I could go on and on. And I really, truly believe that it's no one thing that has caused this explosion of anxiety, depression, and other mental health disorders. Uh, lack of sleep is another big one. Shashank and I are always talking about that. And I think I probably didn't get enough sleep last night, too. And I know the effects of that and, and what it feels like. And when your brain is growing, that's really serious. We need to take that seriously. At my school, and I know I'm going over a little bit, so I'll just speak briefly. We, we've done a lot. We're doing a lot. It is my first year as principal, so I feel really privileged in that I get to incorporate some of my ideas, the things that I've wanted to do for a long time, and I've, I've been able to surround myself with people who have the same goals. So I feel very, very lucky. But one of the things that we do is we talk to kids as they step onto campus, and we did that this year for our freshmen. We talk to them about mental health right away. We're talking to them about messages that society, and including our schools, over the years have sent to them about achievement, what it means, what it looks like to be successful. What does it really mean? Does it mean grades? Does it mean staying up all night doing homework? No, it doesn't. We talk about that very deliberately as soon as they step onto our campus. We introduce them to the resources that we have available, and we tell them that at our school, we don't keep secrets about other people's mental health. If we're worried about a friend, we let somebody know who can help. And if the first adult we go to can't help, we find another person to go to who's going to help. So those very deliberate messages that we're sending to students, and now finally to our parents, 
we were able to talk honestly about the effects that mental illness has, ha has had on our community as a whole and what we want to do moving forward to prevent that. So it's just a start for me. I feel really privileged to be here and to be a part of this conversation. And thanks so much for inviting me. So our final speaker is Dr. Shashank Josie. And I'm going to be a little personal here. Um, my daughter had high anxiety in high school. And we um, had the good fortune to find Dr. Josie. And he provided great guidance and support to both my daughter and to me. And I think that is what we need to be um, Focus on is making sure that we provide the support these young people need so they can survive high school. Because frankly, it's a whole lot different than it was when any of us went to high school. And I think we, we know that instinctively, but I don't think we know it in the way that these young people um, live with it. Um, you'll see people walking around now. You can start writing your questions down, and we will take as many as we possibly can uh, during the time frame that we have. So if you would just indicate to whom you would like your question answered. Uh, we'll be happy to, to do that. So let me introduce Dr. Josie by telling you that he is the child and adolescent psychiatrist at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. She's, he's also professor and director of training in child and adolescent psychiatry at Stanford University. And he has partnered closely with the San Mateo Union High School District in designing the mental health and wellness program. Um, he really is a remarkable uh, resource to this county and has helped us with the gun violence prevention programs as well and um, with this mental health I issue as um, we have undertaken that. So Dr. Josie, please join us and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Speer and um, all of you for coming tonight. So just going to make a few comments. Um, special shout out to Vivian and Fenn for your comments to get us started here. And um, uh, a lot of gratitude to um, both April Torres and Michelle Levine for being partners as I've grown up um, as an academic uh, in the last 20 years at Stanford. Um, but not only as a faculty member, but also as a community member, as a little league coach, um, uh, and also as a parent of a teenager who struggled. And uh, so I've learned a lot, and I've already learned some tonight. And I think that's the most important and most privileged part of being an academic. Uh, you not only get enormous support spiritually from the people you do work with and partner with, um, you get uh, angel investors in some of your work, um, and we have some angel investors in the room today, um, like Lisa Moldau and Ashley McDevitt, who, without whom um, this work would not be possible. Um, folks like Superintendent McGee and Superintendent Skelly, who really see the connection between mental health and overall health, and that better brains, healthy brains make better students. We can all believe that, but unless you have real leadership at the top, to empower folks like Kindy McAmal and Mary McGrath and April. You know, it's just an idea. And we can have all the science that we can develop, but to implement that science, you need partners on the ground. Um, and most importantly, the youth. Uh, but also, I think parents and the community schools are not in the business of mental health, but schools find themselves at the center of where mental health is provided. In the United States, about 75% of all of mental health services are provided in schools. And so we might think about ourselves in psychiatry or in pediatrics that we see our patients in our clinics, but actually mostly these kids are getting services in schools in places like San Mateo County and Santa Clara County where they are doing it very well. Um, we can see the direct effects in terms of greater engagement in the classroom. And so, I have learned a couple of things that I will share, and then um, I'll rejoin the panel and we'll take some of your questions. So mental health is for everyone. Um, so you've heard a little 
self-disclosure from the congresswoman and from myself, we know mental health is for everyone. We know mental illness discriminates against no one. And so nationally, although rates of depression and anxiety continue to climb over the last 10 years, and California has paralleled the national rates for the most part, but some of that tide is turning. So you might have read recently that Santa Clara County to our south has actually just started to turn the tides over the last four to five years. San Mateo County is not far behind. With these school-based mental health efforts, we're seeing not only the results for the youth, but also for their families and their communities. <clears throat> we have a lot of advocacy. We had Prop 63 in the early 2000s, which was the millionaire's tax. 1% on all personal incomes over a million dollars. I really wish I had that problem to deal with. Um, but I am one of the beneficiaries as a taxpayer in Santa Clara County. Um, so a lot of dollars going into mental health in all 58 counties and all the county behavioral health directors get money to put toward programs, innovative programs um, that really can help to um, turn the tide in terms of the rising mental health crisis that we've been hearing about and talking about. We have policies like the Pupil Suicide Prevention Bill, AB 2246, that requires all school boards in the 58 counties to have a suicide prevention policy. And now that has gone from grades 7 through 12, and it comes down to kindergarten. So kindergarten through sixth grade now, we have to have suicide prevention policies, obviously less relevant for younger children to learn about, say, suicide as a word, but more about what happens if you are worried so much that you can't pay attention in class, or you're so sad that nothing would cheer you up, or you lose interest in the things that you like to do? What about if you're worried about yourself, if you're worried about a friend? Who would you talk to? Um, Michelle talked about her and I being trusted adults for each other. She's talking about a program called Sources of Strength. How many of you have heard of this program? Sources of Strength, stay tuned. You will be hearing about it um, sooner than later. It's uh, one of the only evidence-based peer leader programs in the country. And it's not only really important for suicide prevention, it's also um, enormously helpful for well-being promotion. And um, St. Ignatius and, and now San Mateo Union and Palo Alto Unified and a number of districts around the state have adopted this program um, that uh, takes peer leaders and really helps them to propagate messages of hope, help, and strength. These peer leaders propagate these messages with the help of trusted adults in school as well as out of school. And we've had the good fortune of being able to study that and really see how it can not only prevent suicide but also uh, really positively affect communities. These partnerships that you are so fortunate to have in this district with San Mateo Unified and Peninsula Healthcare District um, and Stanford and other places um, where the focus has been, again, mental health is part of overall health and children and teens needing to be healthy enough to learn to access the curriculum and understanding, for example, the stresses of transitions, not only from high school to what comes after, but also middle school to high school and from going into kindergarten and elementary into middle school. And so here we've come to understand the power of things that maybe we take for granted, but that we might do around our dinner table. Things like power of gratitude and gratitude exercises, the power of mentors, the power of life-affirming positive activities. Um, the naming of trusted adults being something that can be very important for school communities. And one of the research outcomes we follow as a measure of uh, predictor to get help is being able to name, uh, in the schools we've studied, they go from maybe not being able to name one to be able to name more than two. And um, for teachers, this can be extraordinary. Some teachers aren't even aware that they are identified as a trusted adult. And so some other work now that's coming out looks at, well, how do we empower teachers to have these conversations and listen to students in distress? Not to turn them into therapists, but really to empower their therapeutic role as trusted adults. And we've seen some very simple programs have some very powerful impact. And finally, um, 
we talk about suicide prevention and well-being promotion together. And so some other partners in the audience, Becky Beacom, who was one of the first um, developers of the Herd Alliance, which is the Healthcare Alliance in response to adolescent depression. And Becky and others in the Palo Alto community recognize we can't conduct suicide prevention without well-being promotion. We have people from the Center for Youth Mental Health and Well-Being here, Vicki Harrison and Ana Lilia Soto, and their work with youth is among the most important lessons that I've learned as an academic, as a parent, really listening. So when we start having our meetings in Palo Alto with city and police and schools and faith-based and all these organizations, we'll have the meetings not during school, have the meetings after school so youth can be not only at the table but can help to lead us. So I've already learned so much tonight from our youth in addition to learning from our young people over the last 20 years. Um, I've seen the future and I think we're in very good hands. Um, so tonight I'm, I'm hoping to hear more from our youth on the panel and to hear from all of you. So thank you very much. Okay, let's start with these questions. I guess I'm going to ask the first question, which I want to ask of Vivian and Finn. Uh, if you were in a position to um, have a huge impact on young people today that may be struggling in school, what would you do? Okay. Well, personally, I have a younger sister. So I think when it comes to talking to youth, I think it's very important to me, especially since I didn't really know about mental health until probably about two years ago, beginning of high school. So I think the discussion of having it early on, probably like elementary school, would be really good. Because if I would have known earlier, I think I would have, it would have been easier for me to get through it. So I definitely say starting young, especially because I have a little sister. I say ditto that, and also I'd like to speak to the fact that, you know, there's a lot of stigma, like a lot, a lot of stigma. Like, I told, I've told i told some of my friends that I'm on meds, and they've been like, why are you on that? And I'm like, because it's keeping me alive. And, um, you know... I just think stigma reduction and education are where we need to focus our efforts. Also on, you know, giving people good access to health care and all that good stuff, too. Okay, thank you both. Okay, this is for all panelists. What do, you, what do we as parents do to better support our children experiencing depression and anxiety beyond facilitating their work and there are school wellness centers and outside therapy. How can we encourage connectors and open dialogue with our kids who are connect who are conned that they're they've got this and can do this on their own, in quotes. As parents, our hearts are bleeding for our kids who don't want us in. It's powerful. Um, so, who should we start with? Doctor? I, I, I nominate April. To start. April, okay. <laughs> he does this all the time. Um, so I'll start with, um, I have two children that are in this school system. I have a ninth grader and a 11th grader. And um, boy, have they thrown me for some loops. And I've had to walk out of the room a couple times and take a breath. Um, but <clears throat> when I talk to youth, um, I hear the same thing over and over again, which is, I just need you to listen. I don't need you to give me advice. I don't need you to fix it. I just need you to listen. So I try to keep that in the forefront of my mind when I'm talking to my own children or listening to my own children. 
and I'll often ask them, do you need anything from me or do you just want me to listen? And they've always appreciated that conversation. And I do the same when I work with young people that are not my own children. And giving them that autonomy to make the decision on what they need is very powerful. Maybe you can um, share with us what you do when the, um, the family member, the, the son, the daughter, don't want to talk to you. I mean, she, one of the references here is they won't let us in. I'll say a few things and I'll let uh, Shashank follow up. But, um, you know, taking those moments when you can, whether it's a ride to the store, it's um, get, taking them out of the space that they're in with you typically. Maybe it's going somewhere with them and not bringing, having time where you don't bring up certain things like school or something that's a sensitive subject. That's always helpful. Um, and letting, letting your students know that they're also your child, right? They're not just a student. They're, they're, they're more than that, right? That's just a part of who they are. And giving them that space to be reminded that you are there just to listen and be part of enjoying them and not worrying about grades, I'm not saying never worry about grades. I'm just saying, you know, there's times to just take a break. I would say a couple of things. I can't, we cannot overemphasize the listening piece. If a kid, if a student or a child will talk to you, please listen and be open to hearing something that you don't want to hear. We're often really afraid as adults, well, what if? he says that he wants to die, or what if he, be open to hearing whatever your child has to hear, and don't be afraid to answer the question that you're, that, to ask the question you're afraid to ask. If you're worried about your child, you, you have every right to ask the questions. I often tell parents, and this sometimes works, and not always, um, but it, it sometimes works. If you have built up rapport with your child, and you are spending time where they're not feeling um, as if they're being um, questioned or interrogated, but in fact that there's good conversation, back and forth conversation, to, to take advantage of those moments and just enjoy them. Don't try to take it somewhere else. And then when you are really, really concerned, um, it sometimes works to say, it's time for a mandatory conversation. I'm gonna ask you some important questions and I'm gonna need some answers. I'm your parent and I'm very, very worried, and I'm gonna need to hear some answers. It's mandatory, and that's difficult, and again, sometimes it, it, it may not work, but it's definitely worth a try. I have a teenager as well, and he's, he can be very difficult to talk to, um, and I've had all those conversations with him, and, and I, the, the main thing, again, is back to the listening piece. He will sometimes say something that really surprises me. I'm convinced that I know him very well, and he'll say something that really surprises me that takes me in a totally different direction than I thought I was gonna go. And if I let him lead it, the conversation's always better and more rich. And then, it, and you're more likely to know what to do next. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak quickly from a youth perspective. Um, Often when we don't want to open up to our parents, that's because we're afraid of what we think you'll think or what you have done based on past patterns. So maybe just like, you know, take, your, take it easy on your kids, guys, please. So lean in with curiosity and be be available just be present and being mindful that not everything needs an immediate response mm -hmm. all right gotcha girl uh, i don't really have that much to add other than to say um there are going to be moments when your teen might let you in but they may not come at the most expected moments or the planned moments. So I think Michelle and April both talked about these. You know, parenting is moment to moment. You have to be ready for 
when the opportunity arises. It's it's usually not when you're ready. Um, it's or when mostly you have when time. Just, yeah, or when you have time. It's just kind of when you're hanging out, probably. Um, but my uh, colleague at Stanford, who's now at NYU, Rebecca Rielon Berry, she's a psychologist, phenomenal. Um, she worked in a treatment called Parent Management Training, PMT, which is developed for um, parents and families dealing with um, just difficult interactions between especially, um, I'd say, 5 to 12-year-old uh, children, and then for teenagers is another module. But anyway, in PMT, there's a saying that I think is great for all of parenting. And so Rebecca, I wish I had coined this, but in her work, she talks about connection before correction. And so this is all about your relationship. Your teen will be more likely to let you in if they don't feel judged or if, as you said, you know what, you got to be ready for the moment and then for what you're going to hear. And um, that will probably serve you well, but it can be frustrating when you want to have conversations and you know, your, your teen's not quite ready. But that, that has a lot to do with, I think, what Fen just said. And um, I think I'll leave it there. So I'll, I'll share with you a personal story. I can be in a very heated meeting. I can be meeting with some very important people. If one of my children calls, I excuse myself and make time for them. I think sometimes we put off talking to them because we want to wait till we have time and they're not going to want to talk to us when we have time they want to talk to us when they want to talk to us so I think that's important um, okay Vivian how did you get over the death of your friend did you do any specific things were the people around you supportive what would you recommend to anyone who is trying to get over a loss or depression because of that so personally, right after it happened, I think I was like impacted really hard. And I don't know if it was like meant to be or something, but um, my mom found that HAPY program and I joined it. So that's how I got over it. Well, I didn't get over it, but that's how I dealt with the, the loss. And I think just talking to people who get it, joining anything that you can that will make you feel better. I think specifically talking to people who understand, who have like gone through the same thing is really important because they know what you've been through and they know what you're feeling. And then what would you recommend to anyone who is trying to get over a loss? Really just take your time. It takes a lot of time. For me personally, it's been quite some time. It's been a, a few years and it, it still hurts, but I think just taking your time and there's like different processes to grief. I know it's like sadness, anger, and you know, you're gonna go through all of those. And just having your friends be there for you, your family, just like having a lot of support. Where do I go to access resources, find out what is available, similar to the program you've discussed tonight? How to use and expand on what you've presented? And this is to all the panelists. The internet is always a good start. And, um, you know, I also am an am a advocate of going around and finding what really works for you. Like, if you don't find the thing that clicks with you the first time, keep, keep trying, because there will be someone who clicks with you. I'm not sure. Yes, this is on. Um, so the Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing has a wonderful website. If you just do a search for Stanford Center for Youth Mental Health, it'll come up. You don't have to do the whole thing. Or Stanford Youth Mental Health. I don't know, Vicki, what, what's the best way to do the search? Something like that. It'll pop right up. Those resources are constantly being updated. Um, HerdAlliance.org. Heard, like I heard you. This is the organization that Becky and others started in Palo Alto. It's now a Bay Area organization. But it's a convening of best practices, not only for schools, um, but also for parents. And there's a website, HerdAlliance.org. And that's a convening site um, with not only crisis lines, but also um, helpful websites for learning about mental health. 
think too, um, if you go on to the Smushed um, <clears throat> website, we have, uh, and then all of the school websites, we have uh, information on uh, agencies in our area. And we don't want to forget about the staff that are at the school sites that can support. Might be a teacher, might be a, a mental health therapist, could be the principal, it could be the campus security. So there's a lot of support on the campus as well. Um, also, don't forget your pediatrician, uh, your primary care provider. Uh, for people who have private insurance, that's often the first place we'll recommend you go. For a young person, that may be the place they feel most comfortable going. In fact, one of my students who's now a resident at Stanford, Dina Wang Krause, she did a study um, looking at eighth graders and where they tend to reach out for help. And it turns out that, at least in that sample, she studied 300 eighth graders, found that girls were more likely to reach out on campus. Um, and we did some qualitative groups, focus groups, to understand why. And it, it seems like, you know, partly because girls will often mature earlier with regard to social emotional learning and intelligence. They feel more comfortable reaching out. They develop those relationships. Boys uh, tend to not want to talk about it as much. This is a generalization. Um, at that time in that study, we did not look at gender nonconforming youth, but just looking, you know, dichotomously at boys and girls, boys tend to reach out to their doctor and to their pediatrician. Mm -hmm. So um, something to keep in mind, same is true if you um, get mental health or insurance through the county. Um, there are really good resources in San Mateo County. Um, we've been throughout California looking at what counties are doing, and uh, we've got really amazing leadership here that focuses a lot on mental health resources, so not only through the schools but also at the county. <coughs> So these are two questions for Dr. Josie specifically and anyone else on the panel who wants to respond. Can you comment on the relationship between screen use, tablets, smartphones, et cetera, and mental health, addiction to entertainment, poor sleep hygiene, et cetera? What can we do as parents of teens? And then the second question is, what do, we, what do you think can be done about kids relying on their peers to self-medicate, such as relying on marijuana, for example? Um, I have a few comments, and then I'll turn it over <laughs> to the... Uh, so I can tell you, at least from what we know about the science, um, the reason the Academy of Pediatrics recommends no more than two hours, aside from school-related screen use, and as a parent of three teenagers, I know there's a, there's a lot of screen time that goes into just doing homework, um, is it, it really is. I mean, if how many of you, first thing in the morning reach for your phones for a little dopamine hit, okay? This is something we all do. So we, we really need to learn how to manage and model the healthy use of screens. And so um, the science is out there. The reason it's two hours or less is because more than that, it just really gets to be a thing that we have a hard time letting go of. So, uh, you know, there's all kinds of correlational data looking at, for example, youth, teens in particular, who've had uh, suicide attempts being uh, more likely to have problematic interactions on social media sites. That doesn't mean all social media is bad, nor should we get rid of it, because we won't get rid of it, um, in spite of you know maybe some of our wishes. Uh, but really, social media can be helpful. Uh, there are a lot of... Um, uh, really interesting work going out now with apps that can be useful and helpful. But it's clear that with the increasing use and prevalence of screens in uh, all of our collective lives, um, we've lost track of some of the usual well-being activities that can help buffer us from stress. So if, for example, we are at a place or in a district where um, our child is experiencing some kind of in-person bullying, and now it's going to extend into the cyber realm, right? So you can't just leave it at 3 o'clock or 3.30 after you get home. You have to see it online. So those are the kind of unintended effects that media can have. Um, there are some really useful sites, I think, for um, 
parents to look at. The American Academy of Pediatrics has some really wonderful media use guidelines for free. American Academy of Pediatrics, just to a search and media guidelines. Uh, commonsensemedia.org uh, is another place that uh, also updates their statistics regularly to look at, for example, which sites young people like to go to, both the ones that are helpful as, ones, as well as the ones that are not so helpful. Um, so I don't really know yet what the science will show us with regard to screen use and the link to anxiety and depression. But what, it is, what is clear is um, those who are most vulnerable to, say, those who um, have had a history of anxiety or depression or have had a suicide attempt, um, these folks tend to get, um, they tend to use their media a little more often and so would be more at risk of depending on their screens over, say, depending on other humans. And so one of the interventions that even online therapy apps make is to really get out and force yourself to, if a friend is reaching out for you to go hang out and do something, to really try to force yourself to do that. It's part of what we do in talk therapy, in certain kinds of talk therapy where we give our um, students or our patients exercises to do. Sometimes you really have to push yourself, especially when you don't feel like you want to when someone is reaching out to you. And the second part of the question was on self-medication, um, marijuana, and other things. So there's a number of programs actually going on in this county, and I'll just call out Sequoia Union. Um, I know they might not be in the house tonight, but Sequoia Union has done some uh, really, oh, we got Sequoia Union yeah. in the house right here. Javier's here, right, good. So we, um, we've learned, there's a wonderful program they're implementing um, called the New Leaf Curriculum. It's based on a program called the Neuroscience of Addiction. And they've actually looked at more than 10,000 students and found that you can, you can teach about addiction and substance use in ways that are not all reefer madness for, you know, I'm totally dating myself now. But, um, you know, marijuana is bad. Stay away. It's evil. Um, you know, it's here to say. You just drive on the 101. You see the billboards. You know, if you're stressed, here's an app that you can get delivered to your house. And, you know, we just have conversations about that. You know, what do you think about that? I'll ask my kids. You know, we had big tobacco when I was growing up as a doctor in the 80s. Now we have big marijuana, right? There's all kinds of claims made. It's like a panacea. So from a science perspective, we just don't have the data. So we, we know that around how it can help. We do know a little something about how it is not really um, at all helpful for things like learning and cognition, at least in the long term. But we have to be careful about how we craft those messages so we don't get tuned out. Um, I think with um, <clears throat> derivatives like CBD and CBD oil, they're, they're so new with recent legalization that I think we, we don't have the science yet, but I am looking forward to seeing some more science about how some non-THC derivatives of the hemp plant might have some medicinal uses. Um, but for now, what we're facing is a lot of claims by a lot of companies who want to say that MJ and THC are like a panacea to everything. And I think that's where we need to really be careful and um, you know, encourage the use of curricula in schools so that kids will come to this on their own because they can get education. Education is power. And I think um, you know, districts like uh, Smushed and Sequoia are really getting it right when they're trying to bring this into the school curricula. Okay, this is for Ms. Levine. What has been the biggest pushback from staff or families with addressing mental health since many families are middle, upper middle class? That's a great question. Uh, absolutely no pushback from families, which is a little bit of a surprise for me. Um, there has been some pushback from teachers. Teachers, especially, uh, we have a, a lot of, we're very lucky. We have teachers who have been at our school for a very long time, and, um, and they're tremendous educators. And um, it's, it's often difficult to, to get them to change. So there has been some pushback. That's really mainly been in the area of homework, um, to be honest. I think that rigor to some people equals a lot of homework. So, so that's one of the areas of pushback. Families have been very, very happy um, to, to talk about and to see some of the changes that we've made on our campus. We were concerned that people would be um, talking about 
whether or not we're going to be actually challenging their students. And my view uh, of mental health, and, and I know I share this view with a lot of other people, is not that we were softer on, on students necessarily or that we ignore rigor. They should be really engaged in their classroom work, excited about what they're doing in the classroom all the time. And they should be challenged in figuring out, trying to help us figure out these problems. One of the major problems that we have or that I talked to my really bright students about, um, students like the ones we're seeing tonight, is help us to solve this mental health crisis that we've got going on. Um, and so we want them to be engaged in helping to solve the world's problems and really uh, challenged in their coursework. So it doesn't mean that we have to be soft on them. We want to send our students messages that they can handle it. So I do think, and that's a mistake I think we make as parents sometimes, is when we're worried about our students, we tend to do more for them, right? We give them more, right? We do things for them that they can do for themselves. And that sends a message that, hey, you can't handle it. So we're not trying to send a you can't handle it message. We're trying to send a message that says, you're way tougher than you think. And when things go wrong, we've got your back. That makes sense. Um, the question also was, how can I help county employees become permanent employees since we serve communities with trauma history and need long-term services? Uh, because I'm not a county supervisor anymore, I can't really help in that regard, but I can certainly convey your interest to Dave Pine and the other members of the County Board of Supervisors because they do have that authority. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments about the, that. Okay. How do we get mental health services to the developmentally disabled who have low communication skills? There are some, but it does not serve all and may be based on insurance. Any thoughts? I think it's really a matter of meeting people where they're at. Like, you know, you can never have an all-encompassing program, but you, what you can do is you can ask people what they need, or if they can't verbally communicate, you just kind of go along with what they're doing and figure out what works best for them. Like, even nonverbal people have cues, right? So, that's my two cents. Okay. Anyone else? What's the question again? It was, uh, how do we get mental health services to the developmentally disabled who have low communication skills? Uh, we do have different programs uh, within the, the San Mateo Union High School District, and we have mental health services supporting many of these programs. So uh, our therapeutic day programs, um, we have a program at um, BHS uh, that supports students, and we have wellness there. So, um, and then there's lots of times that they are getting outside support, so what we do is we work with their outside treating team, their RAP team, on how we can best support them at schools um, to access their education. Yeah. Okay. All right, this is a big picture question for everybody. If you didn't have any constraints, what would you want to do to have the most positive impacts with young people and mental health? No constraints, meaning like all the time in the world. All the money, all yeah. the time. I guess I think what the, what the questioner is trying to get at, where do we need to go to really have the maximum um, programs, benefits for young people with mental health needs? Uh, free or affordable and comprehensive health care, please. Now, the Affordable Care Act provides for mental health parity. So what, what is preventing young people to access mental health services? It's a lot of parental, like, if you're coming here today, you're probably not one of those parents. But there's still <laughs> a lot of stigma around, you know, you know, my kid can't be that kid 
my kid can't be the depressed kid. My kid can't be the kid who's on medication. They'll be weird. And, like, embrace the weird. You know, give the kid the help that they need. So it's a lot of, um, it's, it's a lot of stigma and it's a lot of, you know, kids can't get access to this themselves very easily because of their parents' health insurance plans or because they just don't know how. So I think that's really what I'm getting at. Um, I'll start the list. I'm sure we can all add to it. Um, <clears throat> trainings for staff, uh, more mental health professionals in the schools, um, and support for families. That's huge, and we don't have enough of that um, because there's not enough of us to go around. There's I think some definite, I sorry. <laughs> I think go. definitely support of families. Like personally, for me, like in a Hispanic household, mental health, mental health, and like illnesses that we don't talk about that that does not exist. Like they, it's a lot of like other racial groups too, but they kind of just tend to push it to the side and like fence it. Like that, that's not my kid. So I think definitely just support for the students and for the kids, but most importantly, more, most importantly for like the parents, the families, so they understand how to cope with it too and how to help and how to deal with it. There's a lot of things that I could say. I, I think if there were no constraints, I would like for our kids to be sleeping for at least nine hours every single night mm -hmm. to start with. I'd like our school day to start late. I'd like it to end early. Um, I, I, there are endless things that I that I would like to see happen if there were no constraints. And, and healthcare is a big deal too for for our kids. When we send them off to be assessed, um, and again, I'm in the city. We have kids, students who come to us from the peninsula, uh, sprinkles of students from the East Bay and from Marin County as well. That it's it's very difficult to get proper diagnosis and treatment. Um, for our adolescents. And, and medication is an issue too, because it do doesn't always work the same way for, for adolescents as it does for adults. So it's tricky. If I had it um, the way, any, if I could do anything I wanted, it would be really incredible medical care, quick medical care for our students, and that we in our schools are able to, to do whatever we want. We have access to money and resources, and the power to make decisions to change the school day, time, and structure. Yeah, and I would say that some of that has already come to us. So SB 328, which is a layer school start time bill, was passed. And so you're going to see this coming down the pike. There were a lot of youth advocates, very brave youth, you know, who had to sort of fight against their friends saying, oh, that maybe this isn't so great. You're going to have to change my schedule on. Well, most teenagers love the idea of getting a little more sleep. And um, there was a lot of advocacy to show um, in spite of opposition from the California School Board Association because they were worried about the impact on working families of a later school start time. And actually the data are very clear. Working families benefit the most because your kids are more likely to go to school, engage in school, and graduate from school and have a better future. And so the later school start times looking at national data about how that can be helpful ultimately passed. Um, because there was some science to show that it could really benefit teenage brains and teenage learning. Um, I think that there have been so many wonderful initiatives from this county office of ed and Peninsula Healthcare District, and we've learned together that most of the time our attention, the people on the panel, including the youth here who are probably, you know, peer supports for their friends, people usually come out to us when things are pretty desperate or problematic. And so, you know, the, um, the saying of the ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure, it's actually way more hmm. worthwhile. And so a lot of the programs now, because we have AB 2246, which is the pupil suicide prevention bill, we now go down to kindergarten, AB 1767. This allows us to bring well-being and well-being promotion into the very young grades. And I think that's an opportunity for us. We can use instructional time now to, to bring best practices. And so what we need is, is we need more um, 
superintendents like Superintendent McGee and Superintendent Skelly, um, and are you know we're we're pretty lucky here uh, in California, Northern California, with um, we have um, people representing us like um, Congresswoman Spear and Congresswoman Eshoo and and others uh, that really understand the connection. Uh, but I think we do have this opportunity now to put it into action. We have the bills now to help us to take this, the question was around, well, if you could do anything. Well, I, I would like to get more stakeholders at the table at these school boards around Santa Clara and San Mateo County to agree to start to teach about well-being at a very young age and to help kids identify when to, um, you know, get help for themselves or a friend, not until it's desperation time, but maybe just um, an, an extra... Um, an extra play activity they really enjoy or teaching teachers how to implement social emotional learning. There's lots of curricula out there that are pretty simple to train in, but we do need a coalition of the willing to make room for it in the curriculum. So I actually think we're going to have some opportunities here to build that from the foundational grades on up. So on that hopeful note, we want to make sure these um, young students get enough sleep tonight. Um, so we're going to bring this to a close. I want to thank Alexandra Carter on my staff who helped put this whole event together. Thank you, Alexandra. I, I want to thank all of our panelists, Dr. Josie, uh, Principal Levine, April Torres, Marriage and Family Counselor, and to Fenn and Vivian. Uh, thank you all for participating. And as Dr. Josie said, mental health is for everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. <laughs>